everyone. I'm Donna Fiducia. And I'm Don Newen. And this is Cowboy Logic Radio. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. When their hearts were filled with memories, their bodies filled with birds. They would sit around the campfire and exchange a piercing glance. Back when the West was really wild, Cowboys didn't dance. Welcome to Cowboy Logic Radio, everyone. I'm Donna Fiducia. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Don Newen, and I'd like to be the first to welcome you to tonight's riveting episode of Cowboy Logic Radio. Boy, <laughs> have we got a show for you. We got a big show. Back to you, Donna Fiducia. Not rain, nor sleet, nor snow will stop the postman from delivering his mail, but... Indigenous People Day will prevent the mailman from delivering the mail. You know, can't the Italians get one lousy day a year? Columbus Day. It was Columbus Day yesterday. It's not Indigenous People's Day. How do we know what Indigenous people were here? How do we know? I mean, because the American they teach Indians it were in here American when... history. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, they don't teach that anymore. Listen, speaking of Italian People Day or Columbus Day, <laughs> what if you tr- because you're Italian mm-hmm. for the most part? Yeah, fiducia. Mm-hmm. What did it used like? What was it way back many years ago when your people were stomping on grapes in Italy? Fiduciary, I guess. Okay, means trust. Yeah, like a fiducia, right. a bank. I got it. I got it. Mm-hmm. Now. For those of you that have not been paying attention to Cowboy Logic Radio lately, I think uh, I need to bring you up to speed, and that is that we are big fans of another paisano. Yes. And his name's Dan Bongino. Yeah. Now, I learned something very fascinating. Uh, I think it was Monday night that I was listening to Bongino fill in. He filled in for Levin? Yeah. By the way, let me go on the record right now. Donna Fiducia and I believe that Dan Bongino should be offered his own show on the Fox News channel. Absolutely. And quite frankly, I'd like to see him replace Laura Ingram. Well, I don't know about that, but I, he should get... But see, that would be sexist, because you're putting another white male in place of a woman. That's true. Well, he's kind of an olive-colored male. He's Italian. Yeah. All right, yeah. so anyway, here's a fun fact about Dan Bongino. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so when his when his peoples came My over... My peoples. Yeah, when they came over to the United States, mm-hmm. his... People that would be considered much older than he is, like maybe his ancestors, thought that it wasn't cool to be Italian. True. Right? His real last name used to be Bongiorno. Was it really? Yeah. <laughs> I figured it was Bon Giovanni or something like no, that. No, Bongiorno. <laughs> now, here's the thing. And he admitted to this. Bon I'm not saying sure anything. Or no. Yeah. I'm not saying anything that Bonjour. Dan. <laughs> It didn't already say. That's pretty damn but, funny. But check this out, Donna. Mm-hmm. How is it they, that they that his ancestors somehow thought by changing the name from Bonjourno to Bongino <laughs> would make him any, any less difference. Italian? <laughs> I know. I mean, that's like if some numb nut on your side of the family said, "Hey, you know what? Fiduciary sounds pretty Italian, <laughs> and they might, you know, associate us with the mob or something like that, you know." <laughs> And we might be whacking people, so let's change it from fiduciary to fiducia. But they and we'll did. fool them all. <laughs> they did change <laughs> names, though, when you came through Ellis Island, as the fiducia side of my family did. But my mother's side of the family actually came through Canada, and she was an Ambrose, and I believe they shortened it from Ambrosio. Something well, maybe. like that. You know, but, I've never but, looked into if, it. If I'm Dan's afraid to do ans- my DNA. Yeah, but look, if Dan's <laughs> ancestors were trying to figure out a way to not be, like, labeled Italian. Bongiorno, Bongino, what's the difference? Massive difference right there. <laughs> Massive change. Let's- I know it fooled me. I thought he was, like, I don't know, Norwegian <laughs> or something like that. Speaking of which, let's look at your side of the family, Nguyen. Yeah. Let's look. Tell everybody what that was shortened from. Neuen Schwander. <laughs> ah, yeah. I know nothing. 
Nein. <laughs> well, yeah, it was. It, Neuenschwander. <laughs> which there are still boatloads boat loads of them. I mean, it's it's a, of Swiss heritage. They're up in Bern, you, Indiana. If you dig way back, it's actually Irish. Well, there's Irish and Swiss. But when you go up to Bern, Indiana, where your father grew up. That's B-E-R-N-E. N-E. Yes. And there's unfortunately a huge mosque not too far from there. But Bern, Indiana. Yeah, but that's in a, that's in a different state, Donna. Yeah, but it's pretty close. <laughs> Toledo, Ohio, on the oh. way up to Bern. No, you but, don't go. No, you don't. <laughs> You, we went through Toledo, Ohio. To drop the horse off? To drop a horse oh, off okay. in Michigan. Oh, yeah, you betcha. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we <laughs> went where there's, to uh, your Where there's Michigan. plenty of mosques there as well. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, but we're in Bern, Indiana, which is which like... Which is nowhere near being this in, mosque. But it's like being in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I mean, there's horses and buggies. Amish people are there. It's, oh, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. And then if and then I'm, I'm thinking to myself, what kind of name is... Neuenschwander. How many people have a name of Neuenschwander? Everybody you, up there you does. You go everywhere. You got, there's a Neuenschwander. You got Leakties, Lehmanns, <laughs> Nussbaums, Neuenschwanders. <laughs> yeah, you do and you clean it up. You Neuenschwander, you do and you clean it hey, up. Hey, if you Neuenschwander, you know, you want to make sure you don't do that and drive. <laughs> Let me tell you there. Let me tell you, Donna. No, so anyway... That was my last name, and it's spelled N-E-U-E-N-S-C-H-W-A-N-D-E-R. I think Nguyen is preferable. At this point, I can see why they shortened it to Well, my Nguyen. grandfather did it. Yeah, well, that's a good thing, he said, I guess. Screw the schwander. You know. Let's make it a new one, and let's put a bunch of vowels together and make it so nobody can ever spell it right. But How it's spelled spell the same N-U-E-N, forwards. N-U-E-N, new, new, N, new. Yeah, what do they call it when it's a polydrome when they spell the same forwards yeah. and backwards? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Fiducia's I'm not I'm the same like coming that. and going, by God. <laughs> new one. <laughs> new one. Schwander. N-E-U-E-N. And as a matter of fact, I'm done new one, Schwander. <laughs> see how see, that doesn't have the, the no, same ring. No, it doesn't ring. work. Does it not doesn't work. work. But I done new one. Can we please, though, have one day, us Italians, there has never been an Italian president... There has never yeah, been. Yeah, there was. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He's not Italian. <laughs> he's got a, he's Italian got a valley at the end of his middle, middle name. name. Okay. We, meanwhile, we have no rights here. We have no rights whether you're minute, Italian or whatever you, didn't, you are. No, hold on a second. Something you didn't know. What? Thomas Jefferson was Italian. You know what his no, middle, I didn't know His that. middle name is Giuseppe. <laughs> Thomas Giuseppe Jefferson? Yeah. Maybe Mike Pompeo will run for president. There's one. I'd vote for him. Maybe he, he'll run a, for he's president. He's a power guido. He's a, he's a power guido. <laughs> he is. I wonder if he wears like think? uh like guinea tees under his shirt. <laughs> Where did he grow up? Did he grow up in Joyce? I have no idea. I really he don't. He sounds like he did. Yeah, they all do. A lot of them. They sound like New York, that kind of thing. Speaking of which, Yankees are losing. <laughs> <laughs> Down two games to one. I love it. <laughs> Go hey, Red Sox. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Donna's a big Red Sox fan. And who would you like to give a shout-out to that's such a big uh, uh, Yankees fan? Your old buddy. Uh, my old buddy over at Fox, Todd Kelly, who's a producer at Fox. He texts Try me Try spelling his first name backwards. <laughs> Dot. Like Nguyen. Dot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be Dot, but it would be heavy emphasis on the on the first D. Yeah. Or maybe the first D's silent. He never talks shop with me. Never. He never talks shop with me. But, man, but all sure I hear about baseball. is the Yankees. <laughs> he does. All right, so let's get down to business here. Does Derek Jeter still play for the Yankees? No, he doesn't. What about A, Thank a-, God. a- Fraud? A- Fraud? No, he doesn't either. Thank what are they God. doing now? Neither does Johnny Damon. Probably Damon's selling elect, you know, exercise equipment. The traitor that equipment. he was. You know, I love Johnny Damon. You know, Johnny Damon has like 10 kids. <laughs> I think <laughs> but his he can wife afford probably it. had them. <laughs> But he's a he's a big Fox News Channel. Well, he's a conservative. Fan. Is he he's not? very conservative. He's always on the Fox Business Channel. But he admitted that he prefers the Red the uh, Yankees over the Red Sox. <laughs> it's right because he, he might made more money. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's because might... George Steinbrenner, another Irish boy. <laughs> Wonder what his name was shortened from uh, Steinbrenner uh, Minsky. Let me Minsky. think here. Let's think here. <laughs> uh, what would he, what? Let's give Let's give George Steinbrenner a an Italian middle name. What do you think it ought to be? George uh, Giuseppe. <laughs> no, you can't use that. That's Stein- Thomas Jefferson's middle name. Oh, okay. I don't know. Come on, come up with one. I have no idea. I did George to uh, Peter. Oh, come on. <laughs> El Lamo. <Paul. laughs> 
<laughs> no, know. come on. It's got to be Italian sounding. Come on. I'm putting I'm you not, on the nobody spot Nobody in my family has an Italian sounding name. I got Peter, Paul. My brother's name is Doug. I don't well, know where that all came from. Okay. I don't use somebody in your family. That's, that's not all the, I can think of the, right off the bat. That's not the, the objective of the game. Well, the game is to come up with something very Italian. I have no idea because I'm not Italian, really. I'm American, damn it. I speak English. Well, I get I that. I couldn't even speak a darn word of Italian except buongiorno, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, Speaking I'm going to think, think of George Steinbrenner's middle name okay. while you're doing whatever you're doing with May your massive amount peace. of notes. Well, I have massive amount of notes, which you'll never get to. Uh, speaking of speaking English and, and trying to come here legally like my family did, and yours, and most out there. 22 million illegals are here. Illegals are here in the U.S., according to uh, some Yale professors that um, did some research on that. Not 11, like they've been saying. Not 11 million, but 22 million. And in California, the California DMV has registered non-citizens to vote. Thank you, Bill Clinton, for the voter motor bill. But California, forget it. I mean, even if you were to have a real election... It's going to be impossible for Republicans to, to win there because California's registering non-citizens to vote. And, of course, the majority of them will be Democrats. So Previously, hold on a second. Let me, while you're on California, let me tell you about something that happened today. Mm -hmm. So I had this guy call me, and he was looking for a job driving with star coaches. He wants to be an entertainer, an entertainer coach driver. So he calls up, and I ask him, well, where do you live, man? And he goes, oh, I live in, you know, Southern California, I won't say the name of the city, but I live in Southern California. Uh -oh. And I went, <laughs> why? <laughs> why the hell would you want to live in that crap hole of a state? And he laughed and he goes, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. It's terrible. I said, what is wrong with your governor? <laughs> I mean, he sucks. And the know? guy goes, no kidding, man. He's, this guy was an L, he was an L.A. cop for really? 32 years. Wow. And so I had to follow up with the question. Listen, are you able to get into Canada? Or do you have any <laughs> felonies that you haven't told me about? He goes, man, I just told you I was an L.A. cop for, for 32 years. I said, what's that got to Doesn't do with anything? Doesn't mean anything. Yeah, can you get into Canada? <laughs> well, yeah. I, I let my passport lapse. Oh, so you're here on a bogus visa. I see how that works in California. But you know what? Seriously, it's such a beautiful state. It's such a shame. I mean, when we're is gonna Tom be talking... Del Beccaro? When's he going to move? Well, we're going to be talking to him, in fact... Uh, right after the break, our uh, political pundit and our big legal eagle from uh, San Francisco area who yeah, but we get, ran look, against he, Kamala on, Harris and unfortunately lost and should have won he's if on they had a decent he, election. Tom Del Beccaro is on CPT. California time? People time. California Why? people time. Why? Well, we got to wait three hours for him to catch up with us every day. I mean, yeah, but, it's pathetic. But he does call us on time. So <laughs> if you call that on time... Well, yeah, we have to. Hey, what's adjust. his middle name? He's Italian. I don't know, actually. Giuseppe. <laughs> it's probably. Giuseppe. I think we ought to name everybody Italian. Their middle name should be Giuseppe. So I agree with you. Let's You're call somebody who definitely George Giuseppe Steinbrenner. <sighs> so Hillary is calling for an end to the Electoral <laughs> College. Hillary's yeah. back. She's like a, a athlete's foot. She just keeps coming back. She's like jock rot. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps coming back. Like clap. Can I say that on the air? Yes, you just did. Clap Neither. on. Clap on. Hillary's back. <laughs> if you clap your hand, she reappears. Meanwhile, the Clinton crime family marches on. The national Didn't you say she was coughing, though? Well, well, I'll get to that. The National Review is reporting that the Clintons are launching a speaking tour to, quote, Provide insight into where we go from here, unquote. Yeah, which I can tell them so where to go from here. Just where is that if, if the Clintons got everything they wanted? Venezuela? Cuba? This is a 13-stop event called An Evening with the Clintons. Oh, I bet that's going to be true. Man, are they fabulous. the epitome of modern-day snake oil salesmen, though, really. <laughs> Attendees will pay as much as, get a load of this, Two hundred and eighty-eight dollars and forty-four cents to hear them. Now, how did they? Where did they get... come up with that number? That's what I want to know. Meanwhile, nobody came to see her when she was running for <laughs> president for free. <laughs> hey, and my son, my youngest son, can attest to that. Oh, that was pretty funny. That was pretty right funny. after the in in uh, when was it? Twenty sixteen. Yeah. Right after the uh, the DNC, the 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 you know where they gathered and you know 
Yeah, that light thing. blue bus. Yeah. Star coach is How actually. Sickening. I didn't have anything to do with yeah, it. I know, but I refused to take part. Well, we in have it. the Trump bus for 2020. But it's here's, still here's the deal Parker was out there with them because he worked for the company that wrapped that bus. Right. And so he had to follow around and he would call into us and go, hey, Donna, hey, Don- Dad, like, <laughs> nobody's here. He goes to me, nobody's here. And. Bill Clinton looks really sickly. (laughs) And who's the (laughs) angry woman? And there's this angry woman walking around with dark brown hair with her hands. And I said, I said, I bet you. I said, send me a picture. I said to Don, I bet it's Humamadan. And sure enough, it was. was (laughs) Angry Huma. And he kept texting me all these little things that they were doing behind the scenes. I finally said, Parker, if you don't stop, they're going to confiscate your phone. (laughs) I said, just. Just call me if you want to say something. Don't be texting me anything because you got so proof he did. right there. He called us at about four o'clock in the morning when <laughs> when the hotel that they provide that the Clinton people provided them with was an absolute s s hole. The ceilings were falling in. There weren't lights. There was not even a name. Should have gone back and slept on the bus. <laughs> not to mention they had them working at slave hours because they would work until three or four o'clock in the morning. They had to be back on duty at six. All of that so 316 people could show up <laughs> at a rally in a VFW club or well, an elementary school cafeteria. Right now, though, you can experience one-of-a-kind conversation with two individuals who have helped shape our world. For $288.44 a-, <laughs> a ticket, ladies and gentlemen, reserve seating now. And they helped shape our world and had a front seat to some of the most important moments in modern history. Um... Benghazi comes to mind for me. Yeah. <laughs> the tour starts November 18th after the midterms because none of the Democratic candidates, even in Bill's home state of Arkansas, have sought the Clinton's endorsement. That's got to tell you something. Meanwhile, Hillary did have another uncontrollable coughing fit at Mans, uh, Mansdell College or something. Wherever the heck. It's in Where England. Is that? It's in England. And guess what she was doing? She was unveiling a statue of Eleanor Roosevelt, whom she said, remember, when she was a first lady, that she channeled Eleanor Roosevelt. And then they were all over Nancy Reagan for saying Nancy went to a shrink. But, yeah, uh, Hillary channels Eleanor Roosevelt. Unbelievable. So $288.44, folks, and you, too, can see the Clintons. So, Donna. Yes. I've got the most common Italian first names for men. Uh, Giuseppe. That's one of them. Okay, I figured. How do you spell that? G I U S E P P I. Oh, close. I'm wrong. But wrong. Oh, really? E on the end. Oh. Okay, we got Marco. Oh, okay, yeah. Polo. I should have thought of that one. Alessandro. I thought that's more Hispanic. Antonio. Antonio. There you go. Banderas. Like Antonio Banderas. Banderas. Like An- Antonio Scatterface. <laughs> what was his last name? <laughs> Antonio Montana. <laughs> Montana. Girl. Uh, <laughs> Luca. Luca Giovanni. We should have thought of Giovanni. I should have thought of that one. That's like every every Roberto. pizzeria around is Giovanni's. Yeah, Roberto. Roberto. Okay, they all spa- sound Andrea. Hispanic to me. Oh, really? Stefano. Andrea Bocelli. St- Stefano. Oh, okay. Angelo. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Francisco. Antony. Francisco. How about Antony? Antony. Then they got Antonio. Okay. Uh, Mario. Okay. Luigi. Luigi. There you go. George <laughs> Luigi, Luigi Steinbrenner. Steinbrenner. I don't think so. All right. How about for women? Well, hold on. Anna. Okay. Yeah. Maria. Mm-hmm. Sarah. My grandmother's name was I Carmen. all ours. My grandmother's Sarah. name was Carmen. My gra- Sarah. How about Carmen? Is it on there? No. Oh, well. No. Lara. How about Elvira? My mother's name, Elvira. Valencia. <laughs> Ida. My Aunt Ida. How do you say this? G- Adeline. G-I-U-L-I-A. Julia, I guess. Julia. See, I would say Giulia. <laughs> Giulia. <laughs> Rosa. Yeah, Rose. Yeah, Rose is big. Rose Stella. Is big. Stella. Giovanna. <laughs> Never would have guessed any hey, of Hey, Giovanna. <laughs> Go get me my concrete slippers. What do you think Rod Rosenstein's middle name is? I would say uh, Mario. <laughs> So he goes. What about James Comey? 
What do you think his middle name I'm is? Nikki. Francesco. Can I do some news James here? James Francesco <laughs> Comey. I don't think so. Wasn't that an actor? <laughs> James Frans- Francesco? Francesco, but not Comey. <laughs> So Trump goes on uh, Air Force One. They take a trip down to Orlando yesterday with Rod Rosenstein, Steen, whatever his name is. Uh, And he's talking about Rosenstein, Stein, wearing a wire, threats to Devin Nunes, threats about the DOJ being extorted, saying he was, quote unquote, misquoted about wearing a wire to try to show that Donald Trump might uh, be up for the 25th Amendment, and therefore they should throw him out of office. Now he's saying, I think I was misquoted. Anyhow, Trump is trying to kind of, I think, play along with this, let it play out, let the Mueller investigation play out. But they did talk about these things, and they also talked about the fact there was no collusion, no obstruction. And I think what ought to happen is they just launch a real FBI investigation after this soft coup Mueller debacle finally ends. So Trump is essentially letting this all play out and let the commie libs uh, basically not able to complain as much. And we'll see what happens with that. But uh, I would have fired his butt. I'm sorry. While we are changing the heritage of everybody that we're talking about, let's change President Trump. Let's make President Trump Italian. Oh, God. Okay. Donaldo. <laughs> Donatello. Donatello Trumpo. <laughs> no, just Donatello Trump. What's his middle name? Donald J. J- uh, John. 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 Juan. <laughs> well, that's that's Dan Bongino's middle name. I mean, Juan? Bonjour's middle name. Bonjour, <laughs> Bongiorno's. <laughs> yeah. It's John. <laughs> okay. That's a very Italian name, don't yes. you think? Yeah, it is. I actually don't think it is. Fabrizio. Why do we not think of Fabrizio? We've got an Italian friend. We actually do have a, a friend named Fabrizio. He's a conservative Canadian. Yes, and he's he's like the, I don't know how he sings the way he does, but he sings like one of these groups that just screams. Blah, blah. Who and, does? And, and Fabrizio. No, he doesn't. He's a sound engineer. Oh, who am I thinking of? Then? I have no idea who you're Oh, you're talking about Maurizio. Maurizio. Same yeah, thing. He's, the lead, he's another Paisano. He's, how does he... How he's does with he, the band Cataclysm. How does he not lose his voice? It's amazing how he can sing He has like special that. vocal cords. It's unbelievable. They're Italian. He's phenomenal. I love him. It's like a, a fine-tuned Italian race car. So, by the way, we have one minute left. This is it, if you didn't know already. Global warming is undeniable. It can't be stopped. Unless you pay $240 a gallon tax. That's what the U.N. is now suggesting. Geppetto. <laughs> Doesn't he have to have, like, a puppet? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't that Pinocchio's do? dad? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> God, that's so racist. I'm sorry. You wouldn't be able to get away with that. You wouldn't be able to get away with the Three Stooges nowadays. Giancarlo. You wouldn't be able to get away with Little Rascals nowadays. The world has lost its sense of humor. But that is something for another time. Can I say who we have? Genop- Speaking of which, Genopio. Tomas Del Bacaro is coming up. Tomas. <laughs> is coming up after the break. Then we're going to be talking to Brian Maloney of MediaEqualizer.com. And then John Guandolo, another nice Italian guy, understanding the threat.com. Another Juan Dolo. John let me, Guandolo. Let me, let me take us to break. Yes. All that and more coming up on Cowboy Logic Radio. That was it. Check us out on the web at cowboylogic.us. back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Nguyen. And we're going to talk for this next half hour to our good buddy, Tom Del Beccaro, former chairman of the California Republican Party, a lawyer. We won't hold that against him. His books, The Divided Era and the New Conservative Paradigm, are must-reads, especially, I'll tell you, and I always refer to this, Tom, The Divided Era, because to me it's so prophetic. As you said, at the beginning of any kind of um, government, there's a competition for ideas. And at the end, there's a competition for spoils. And it's pretty scary because that seems to be what's happening right now. Everybody jockeying for their little piece of the pie. 
Anyhow, you've read Tom's stuff in um, the Washington Examiner, Breitbart, the Daily Caller, Forbes. His website is a go-to for information, politicalvanguard.com. So many great contributors, including our own Denise Simon there. And if uh, California did have half a brain in their butt, you would have Tom Del Bucaro as your senator and not Kamala Harris. But that, again, is another story. Tom Del Bucaro, welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. Hey, great to be back on. It's been too long. It has been too long, but we have been uh, really, I think, holding on to have you in the wings here because no, no better person to have on than you to talk about this Kavanaugh debacle. Well, before we get into it, Tom, and before you explain all of this to everyone, I want to comment on the book, Divided Era, in which the the line that you always read at the beginning of a... Any a, kind of society or whatever, a government, is a competition for ideas. Okay, and at the end... It's a competition for spoils. Okay, well, I find what's going on right now a competition of spoiled people <laughs> because they didn't get what they wanted in 2016 so they're pitching a bitch and they're whining and complaining and it's becoming to the point tom where i don't recognize someone that aligns themselves with liberal ideology as another fellow american citizen they're unrecognizable to me what say you yeah, you know, uh, Thomas Hall has a great line about when you're when you're used to preferences, when they're taken away, it seems like you're being discriminated against. And, and think about that. That's what's going on. Uh, they, they had the run of of Washington. The left had eight years of of it, and they don't like being without it. And they're willing to do anything anything to uh, hold on to it. And that's what you saw on the, on the broader scale. You know, we talked about this issue of competition for spoils. I mean, the federal government is 37% of the economy. That means all governments are spending $6 trillion a year. Somebody is handing out that $6 trillion, literally. Checks are written, $6 trillion. And someone is, and, and everyone's competing to get it. And that's the new competition. That's this, this spoils competition. And now the Supreme Court is is often in the center of it because just take the Obamacare decision. If if they had struck down Obamacare, over time, hundreds of billions of dollars would have flowed in a different direction than it is now. Mm-hmm. Meaning someone different was going to get it. So, of course, there's this intent. They want in. I, I want my government contract. And the Supreme Court, in my next uh, op-ed that's coming out, I talk about this competition for the Supreme Court. The Democrats have always coveted the Supreme Court. It was FDR, whose New Deal one was struck down by the Supreme Court, who, who bashed the Supreme Court at the time, uh, basically spoke poorly of the founders, saying, yeah, they were revolutionaries, but they were laymen, and they just put objectives in the in the uh, Constitution, and it wasn't a contract. And he just flat out said it had to be updated, and we can't be disturbed by their claims of unconstitutional when we want to he- help the people. And the Democrats have coveted that that institution, the Supreme Court, ever since, and gotten huge, huge victories out of the Supreme Court. And any time that the court was going to move significantly to the right, they'd gone crazy. Remember that Robert Bork was going to replace... Bork and Clarence Thomas were replacing Thurgood Marshall... And Justice Lewis, both of whom voted very liberally, Lewis voted for, of course, for uh, Roe v. Wade. Thomas wasn't going to do that. So it's no coincidence that they went ballistic on those. And now when we look at Kavanaugh, I don't believe Kavanaugh 
would have voted for gay marriage like Kennedy did. And so that replacement, big, big issue for the left. So the Supreme Court, in sum, is handing out important decisions that mean hundreds of billions in spoils and, and also social justice. And so that's why these fights are so large. And if Donald Trump gets another pick, this last uh, 14 weeks is going to seem like child's play. Oh, I agree. Meltdown. You know, I'd love I, to see it. I watched, the, uh, I watched the confirmation vote that took place on Saturday. What an absolute disgrace by the women that were in the gallery. That was a disgrace, yeah, was, man. Yeah, it is. It, uh, I wonder what America thinks of, of the hysterics. I mean, the absolute screaming. I, I still believe that that scares off independents saying, yeah, this too. is the American left. That's I the representative. So. That's of my the next American question left. was going to be. These are feminazis, as Rush Limbaugh called them for years. Has the left jumped the shark at this point? Well, I, I want you to also to understand that none of this is surprising. It is, it is natural as socialism builds to, A, keep going farther when it comes to socialism. They don't come... Once you get government, once you socialize medicine, we have to a, a huge degree. Once you socialize education, we have to a huge degree. And then mm-hmm. once you socialize retirement, and by the way, those are the big three socialists look for in history. You control cradle to, to death, education, health care, and retirement. Those are the big three. That means you have created dependence for for people almost their whole lives on government. They don't stop. They don't pause and say, okay, we we should manage this better, see what's working. They keep moving harder and harder left. Uh, if anybody wants to study the fall of the Roman Republic 150 years before, or the fall of democracy in, in Greece before Philip of Macedon. Uh, uh, Venezuela. Conquered them. Cuba. Just, I mean, yes, they keep pushing harder. So I am not surprised that the left is getting more virulent and pulling over. And the country's not, the country is not where the center left is. So, so what I mean by that is, obviously, scale of one to ten, one being the most conservative, and the and ten being the most liberal, right? Uh, uh, Seventy years ago, the answer would have been that we were significantly to the right of where we are now, but the left keeps pulling, and right now, this co- this country, in a historical perspective, is between pure socialism and and where we started, we're probably at a five or a six, but the Democrat Party's at a nine. The country is still at four. The country doesn't even realize how socialist we are. And so the left, by being hysterical like this, still scares and makes feel uneasy a lot on the on the uh, on even among their own party and even uh, among independent very much so among forty percent of Democrats said if the FBI doesn't corroborate anything then he should be con- confirmed. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. I go back to what I said a minute ago. The left is unrecognizable to me. I don't. The, I, I can't well, I identify. I There's nothing it. that I can identify with someone of the left and myself with regard to patriotism, the love for America, uh, basic social moral values. I, I can't. It, it's like there's they're alien beings, Tom, like from some other planet. They look like us well, to a certain with degree. With little pink hats on. But... <laughs> 
but I can't identify I with them. I certainly recognize them. I certainly recognize them. And the reason why I say that is because through <laughs> one of the first lessons my father, God rest his soul, taught me was that the Democrat, he said to me, I remember this in the 60s in New York, the Democrats have it made, they've convinced people they could vote themselves rich. And since they're doing it with other people's money, it, it is a nonstop escalator to debt and high taxes. It's always been so. So the left is not going to, you know, this young 28-year-old uneducated or uh, or Tez in in Brooklyn or I'm sorry Queens, Queens yeah they they're not going to educate themselves about the long-term risks or where things go they they're not worried about the future because their their present is so secure and they can and they and the they can do these things without you know, with impunity. So the cycle of the way that history works is if you gain security, then you flourish, meaning you're not at war and your borders are safe. You, your wealth is able to accumulate. And then if you're secure all the way, you, you corrupt yourself and collapse from within for Greece and the, it, it was Philip of Macedon who came along and silenced the, the discord at the end. But for America, these people have no consequences to their actions, and they don't worry about the outside world. It, it would be incredibly different if we lived with China on our border. We I was going to say, I think we need to instill a draft and, and let these kids go on the government dole for a couple of years and see exactly how good they have it. I mean, I had no idea. I went to Moscow and I went to Berlin right after the wall came down. I was working at a rock and roll radio station. When I came back from, first of all, we, we go to eat in this restaurant in Moscow and, you know, dog food would have been an improvement. Canned dog food would have been, it was like some chef boy RD thing. And then we asked for se- seconds. They looked at us like we had 10 heads Luckily, one of the guys in the group brought a bunch of uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a couple cans with can openers. Probably wouldn't be allowed on a plane now for uh, of uh, tuna fish. And when the uh, bands got there, was, we were covering uh, the Moscow Music Peace Festival. When the bands got there, like John Bon Jovi and Ozzy Osbourne and a bunch of other bands, they all trucked food in and 18 tractor trailers from uh, other sections of Europe because they knew damn well they weren't ever going to eat otherwise because it was a week-long thing. And luckily, we got to eat with them. Otherwise, we would have starved. I'm telling you, when I got off that plane, I wanted to kiss the tarmac. And you don't realize that unless you see how the other half lives. Okay, and how the past lived. Uh, You know, we don't educate our children at all. We've gone uh, part of the decline of the American civilization it's when we started teaching social studies instead of history, history and, and about our founders. They don't know what the struggle for life is. None of these people do. They think government is the provider because they've grown up under, under that. They have no idea. And, and, and then they condemn the past because the people of the past weren't good enough for today as if in their own lives, in their youth, they were good, good enough but now they're better, so they don't, they don't condemn their own. And, and one of the other the things that I say, you know, at the beginning of the civilization and government, there's a competition for ideas. At the end, there's a competition for spoils. I also say the historical matter, a people at the start of the civilization will do anything to survive. And at the end, they will apologize for doing it. I'll say it again. At the beginning of a civilization, a people will do anything to survive. At the end, they will apologize for doing it. And that's where America is today. We were wrong to to do all these things. You know, we were bad people in a sense, you know, to take over the uh, uh, the continent and on and on and on. Even the, 
World War One days, some people, you know, or two, they question whether we were doing those kind of things. And that's where the left is as well. And so... Well, Tom, I don't, I, I don't think we're at the end of our civilization and that everybody's apologizing. I, th- I think that what's going on here is the left is using a clear tactic of uh, Saul Alinsky in which if you force apologies and create this tribal society that the left insists on doing, then what you end up is with just that, a tribal society that is divided, and as a result, you've got people that are looking at themselves as victims and oppressors. And that's what that's I think this is all by design. I don't think that this is at the end of our society. And as a result, everybody's apologizing for all the screwed up crap that's taken place for 200 years. No, 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 no. I think I, it's I, by design. I, okay, well, what I mean by that is <laughs> the peaceniks that exist today, the the uh, quiet time people or the time out people, all of this could have never built the United States. I also don't want to, after this phone call, never hear you talk about Saul Alinsky again as if he was some sort of innovator. In fact, throughout all of history, the, the, there have been those who understood that runaway populism can result in pushing governments to the left. That is one way to look at what happened in ancient Greece. It is certainly one way to look at at the end of the Roman Republic. And as, as my godson told me a, a joke, which is that socialism doesn't really care who's in power. Ask the Gracchi brothers. The Gracchi brothers are at the end of the Republic who big so, uh, socialists, big government people, big populists want to give everything away, but got swept away and murdered because they weren't good enough anymore. So Saul Alinsky is not that smart, didn't innovate, but he, he there are people from Hillary to many Obama. others. Who, and that's that's Obama's who, main who influence. Yep, exactly. Well, that, and yeah. that's my point in bringing him up. These people on the left are not students of history, If like you. If they were... What do you mean they are, too? In a way, they are. They, they are know. not. They're students of whatever... Whatever gets into well, their little done. teeny pea brain minds. Well, what's been taught, told it's them done, the way it is. Don, my point is, as my dad would say to me, I feel him close to me right now saying, what makes you think they don't know what they're doing? It, meaning, I they do know think how, they know what they're they doing. That's my point. Drive, they know how to drive populism. They do know what they're doing. That's, that's my whole point. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I mean, they're dealing with the short run, but they don't care about the long-term implications. I agree with you there. The, it, you know, there have been too many attempts at socialism in the past not to, not to come to the conclusion that they don't care about the long-term aspects of what they're doing. There are some who arrogantly think they should rule and others who just want power and between the two of them, socialism has been rampant in history. See, I just don't understand how stupid they can be. I'm sorry. Because you have this as, as plain as the nose on uh, Rod Rosenstein's face. You've got Venezuela right here. Okay? And I'm sorry. But they we did can... it wrong, Donna. They did yeah. it wrong. Yeah, I know. And, wrong and so did there. Castro. I mean, my makeup artist at Fox was from Venezuela and she, she, you know, at the time she was saying how great uh, Hugo Chavez was and how popular he was. I said, you know, they said the same thing about Castro. And then he said, everything's going to be great when he came into power. And look at the cast, the, the communist and socialist regimes. Millions of people have died under them and they're just, they're so stupid not to realize this. It just blows my mind. But I wanted Tom Del Beccaro Again, um, your book's The Divided Era and the New Conservative Paradigm. Find all of his stuff at politicalvanguard.com. I wanted to talk a little bit about how they push what you were saying through the court system. We were actually in California in 2008. We voted absentee. 
when Barack Obama, we were right near you, actually, when Barack Obama got elected. We wanted to puke because we're in a restaurant and they're all clapping as he came, went over the top. When we were at a very expensive restaurant that should have given us our We were in free. Mendocino, yeah, Tom. You know horrible. where that little Yeah, no, I, rem- is. I remember well. <laughs> I remember well. Anyhow, but also I believe in California, they had a vote saying marriage was between a man and a woman. And it passed. And then they went and they fought it in the courts and pushed it to the Supreme Court. And it won. I mean... This is the thing. If they, they try the ballot box, and if they can't get what they want, they go through the courts. And that's why they're Which living. Which is why, the, yeah, 100%. Over this, Kavanaugh. That's why, absolutely, because he will restrict that sort of thing. I also want to point out that the makeup of the current conservatives on the court believe like uh, Scalia. That, you know, Scalia was actually... Look, my job's here to say constitutional or not. And if it is constitutional, I don't have a big, I don't have a justice's say as to whether Congress is doing things that are too liberal or too not, or creating too many programs. But I believe in the right of Congress to do what rights are there. So the left, The problem with the left is they don't think Congress will deliver for them, and that's why they went to the courts. But now we're the justices uh, with these five Republicans will give a greater deference to to uh, Congress as long as they don't do something unconstitutional, and they may even give a greater deference to the states as long as they don't do something, you know, way too uh, unconstitutional. The way I see it, we were only a couple votes away in in the Senate from basically saying, hey, it's okay that you're guilty until proven innocent. That's what drives me crazy. These people obviously on the left hate the Constitution because that pesky little uh, piece of paper stands in the way of what they want to do. No, 100%. And that's, and that started with FDR. He, he openly said that we cannot be restrained by the Constitution, and the Democrats have been saying that ever since. Well, I think Woodrow Wilson was pretty much the yeah, start of it, too, FDR even back in the early 1900s. It. It's, hey, Tom, it's, we only got about three minutes left. Let me ask you this, buddy. Uh, a week or so ago, maybe it was last week, Governor Moonbeam... Um, <laughs> evidently signed into made some type of a of a governor executive order or approved something that had to do with the board of directors and that there's now affirmative action with regard to forcing companies to have at least one female member board of yeah. the directions is it a publicly traded yeah. company is that what the yeah the, it's publicly the, the traded law company is? has to have a woman on the board all right what are your thoughts on that tom well this is Social Justice California. They want to move women ahead when the free market does a much better job of that. There are more blacks getting experience and Latinos getting experience in the workforce than ever because the private market's expanding. They don't want to wait for that. They want to legislate these victories. They think they've created a perfect set of laws to exist, yet California still has the highest poverty in the country, and then once, if Gavin Newsom wins and they go all but broke, uh, you know, it, it will it'll be reversed. But this is just another step in Cal. Look, we're supposed to be all, uh, by I think 2045, all renewable energy uh, by then. And you know who gets hurt with all of these things? The poor. The poor, because they can't, they can't afford, afford it. Things. Exactly. They can't yeah. afford it. What scares so, me, though, is that California, as it goes, so goes the rest of the country, and that's really scary. Well, Tom Del Beccaro, The Divided Era and The New Conservative Paradigm are your books. Please, folks, look them up. You can read his stuff in Breitbart, The Daily Caller, Forbes, and uh, you got a bunch of op-eds coming up as well on the Supreme Court. And uh, can they read all the op-eds also on the website, politicalvanguard.com? Yeah, absolutely. You can find everything there. Well, I got Tom, one more question before we go to break. Tom, how how is the used syringe and feces 
uh, situation doing in that lovely city of San Francisco that you're so near? Will you stop? I, you know, I will barely go there. I do political commentary for stations in there. I go there because they have secure parking. Otherwise, I don't go. Well, it's a shame because it's probably one of the most beautiful cities really in the country. Tom Del Beccaro, folks, find his stuff at politicalvanguard.com. Thank you so much. We love you, and we'll talk to you soon. Coming up next on Cowboy Logic Radio, Brian Maloney from MediaEqualizer.com and John Guandolo, UnderstandingTheThreat.com about Islam. It's coming up next on Cowboy Logic Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Donna Fiducia. And I'm Don Newen. And this is Cowboy Logic Radio. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. When their hearts were filled with memories, their bodies filled with birds. They would sit around the campfire and exchange a piercing glare. Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Newen. And our very special guest this half hour is a gentleman by the name of Brian Maloney. Brian's making his debut here on Cowboy Logic Radio. He is a media analyst, co-founder of media the media equality project he's co-chair of the brand new red wave america pack and editor-in-chief as you might know these mediaequalizer.com a wonderful website uh by the way the red wave website is redwave.vote and again mediaequalizer.com but he's an online watchdog for the intersection really of media technology and government so much going on as far as google building search engines and what's going on with the media and the government. Brian Maloney, welcome to Cowboy Logic Radio. Hey, thanks for having me on. Let's start talking right off the bat, since you are really into the technology aspect of this. Google is building a search engine for China, and China wants to put the parameters on there, and they're like, okay, we have no problem with that. Meanwhile, here in the United States, Google is telling the government what they want to do and the restrictions they want to put on, on the American people, the hashtag double standard is unbelievable just about everywhere you look. Well, there's really no way that Google can have any kind of honest relationship with the government of China, considering what they're doing right now. And by the way, that China search engine is going to report back to the Chinese government any search conducted by anyone with their name attached to it. So every single search they undertake will be tracked and monitored. So if they even, you know, stray one iota away from communist doctrine, I mean, they're going to be, it's going to be immediately known to the Chinese government. But they seem to be spying on, on everybody all around the world anyway already. So, I mean, we're hearing that they've had chips implanted in all of our computers and, you know, they infiltrated Apple and Amazon. And I mean, what's going on with China? China's still out of control right now. I, this has got to be a full-time headache for Trump. I can't even imagine what this must be like. Um, I don't know if you heard about this, but in the last uh, 24 hours, it's been reported that the global head of Interpol, kind of a mid-level position in the Chinese government as well, was reported missing. Um, he lives in France with his family. He was returning to China, and he was never heard from again. He's the head of Interpol. I did so, hear I mean, that, you know, actually. How long, is he, how long has he been missing? He's been missing for uh, over uh, late September, I think. She's been missing for over a week. And wow. so then the Chinese government essentially said they've now admitted, well, we, we've detained him. Um, so, and claiming that it's on corruption charges. So now corruption charges is the ready made excuse for detaining anyone they feel like. Um, you know, I don't know if you heard about that movie star they, that went missing in June for the same kind of same murky circumstances. So people just go missing. And nobody knows why or where they are. 
and and then they'll say months later it's some kind of corruption issue. So it's it's becoming absolutely surreal. Wow, it's scary. Because really, I believe if Donald Trump weren't president, we'd have that problem starting to show its ugly head here. I really firmly believe that, and that is something. I mean, if you look at Venezuela, look at Cuba. I mean, this is how things start, little by little. And obviously, the Chinese have been doing it for decades, but that's another story. But to have the head of Interpol gone missing. Talk a little bit about the uh, chips in the motherboard they're putting in. You did talk about that uh, briefly just yeah. a second ago. I mean, it, it was discovered by accident that they had been, the Chinese state security agency had been inserting tiny chips into every motherboard uh, for every device, um, including in servers, you know, in, in Silicon Valley tech companies going back years. Nobody even noticed. It was uncovered by accident by Amazon when they were doing due diligence looking to purchase a, a small company in Oregon, and they happened to discover one of these devices only to then find out that it, these things had infected everything inside Amazon and Apple and, and a lot of other companies, um, and that these motherboards are being made in Silicon Valley. They're not even made, made in China. That's what's incredible, but it was a Chinese-linked company. So we can't trust China as far as we can throw it anymore. We're at the point of a severe crisis with China, and the idea that you know we're being distracted by all this stuff going, you know, all these these battles in Washington and all that, you know, the Trump the Trump has to keep his eye on China twenty four seven. We can't trust it as far as we can throw it. And I, I think to me, this is going to be the biggest issue of the next twelve months is what we do about China. I could not agree with you more. I don't think there is a more serious threat to America than cyber war, and obviously China. North Korea, Russia, uh, Pakistan, Iran, they're all, they're all involved in this, but China's definitely leading the way to the point where, you know, quite possibly Dianne Feinstein's little friend that we, we found uh, yeah, working that Chinese with her as a Chinese spy could, could possibly have something to do with this. The other thing that we got to deal with are the number of Chinese spies that we have infiltrating and have already infiltrated our our education system and our universities. That's huge. Not right. only with not only with uh, faculty members, but also with students. And another thing that's not so much in the cyber warfare of things, but a, a, a little known fact uh, not long ago, but just absolutely appalling, is the number of cameras that China has placed in Washington, D.C. They're all over the place. They're all yeah. over the place, and nobody's nobody's doing anything about this. It's it's appalling at how soft the United States has been on cyber warfare and surveillance from uh, from our enemies. Well, I think that if Hillary had been elected, it would have been even worse. I think she would have been overtly supportive of all of this. I yeah. truly believe we would I not have too. survived a ter- single term of Hillary. Uh, she would not have had any problem with whatever they were doing. So. The bottom line here is that we've got to get his attention focused on this, because you're right. I mean, at the universities, the Chinese government has created these uh, organizations that exist on these campuses um, that are state-funded and state-controlled. And we have several hundred thousand Chinese uh, nationals who are college students studying here in America at any given time. These universities are addicted to uh, having Chinese students because they, they pay you know, out-of-state tuition. They pay tuition at a much higher rate. So there's a huge incentive to have massive numbers of Chinese students and they're crowding out positions that American students could have. So we have to end that now. I think that our days of of having an open relationship with China are over forever, really, uh, until there's major change there maybe. But for the next 10 or 20 years, um, you know, we're going to go back to the old days. Uh, We have to. We We just don't have any choice anymore. I mean, things are out of control. But see, they're waiting out Trump. You know, I mean, their their yeah. government's there permanently. I mean, this is another Mao in the making, in my opinion, unfortunately. And uh, they just right. have to wait out Trump. So another, you know, six years or so, hopefully at least, and then they're they're home free. And if you get another Hillary Clinton in there, like you say, that's it. I mean, they you know they ran roughshod yeah. over Obama. But Everybody what did. what we have, but what we can do in the meantime is engage in economic warfare against them. And I think Trump is already doing a lot of damage with these tariffs. And this is why he's been pushing them so hard. But I think that as conservatives, we haven't been backing him enough on these when we should be. Um, but this is something we definitely should be 
encouraging him to, I mean, he has really held the line on this. I think he, he knew that he had to. He didn't have any toys. Well, so. as he should, as he should. And our friend Curtis Ellis a few weeks ago explained that this tariff situation, that you know, the, the whining and the bitching that's taking place by the left on tariffs is completely unfounded. These tariffs don't affect the end user. They affect the first source of the of the product. And so the left is, is again, beating a, a false drum, spreading fake news about this. this. This tariff thing is wonderful, and it should be implemented, maybe even a little more stricter. But the the bottom line is, it's on the front end of this thing. It doesn't it doesn't trickle up to the end user. Well, that's just it, and and I think the reason why this has been so incredibly effective so far, what Trump's been doing on these tariffs, is because the China really doesn't buy very many of our products. I mean, we are inundated with Chinese products everywhere we turn. But it's not the case in China. They're not buying very many American products. So we can easily do a tremendous amount of damage there without really much damage to us. And that's why it's having such an impact already. Well, I watch the markets pretty closely, and I believe China's uh, economy is down something like 30 percent since Trump's been in office. I mean, that's really, uh, really good news, because like you say, the pressure well, has China's, to stay on. Yeah. Well, their economic statistics in China are made up. I mean, they're manufactured. We've known this for years. They just make up stats. None of them are real. And the bottom line is the economy is supported by these shadow loans. Um, so there's this informal banking sector, basically, you know, these networks of people that loan you money. And most of those are bad at this point. And these loans have gone bad. And there's already unrest uh, being seen in, in Chinese cities as a result of these loans going bad. So the best hope that we have for China is an economic depression there that removes this government from power and they can start over fresh with something else. But another Maoist dictatorship, you know, it's going to really destabilize the entire world. Yeah, I, I agree. That's a tall order, though, because China, I mean, they, you know they've got them waiting in the wings. Yeah. If, if an uprising yes. did take place, those, those Chinese citizens that would not be annihilated by their military... Uh, would have to endure an, another regime waiting in the ring, yeah. wings. I well, that that may that. well be. Yeah, I don't. But see I that think happening. we. Yeah, I think we closed China back off, um, like it was before. I mean, I appreciate what Nixon did. You know, it was it was a great thing at the time. It was wonderful to open it up, but opening it up ultimately was a mistake. And uh, you know, because remember, we were sold a bill of goods. The free trade with China would mean democracy there, um, and that was a fundamentally flawed premise that, you know, that has been the guiding force here. You know, if they just get enough taste of economic success, they'll want, you know, political freedom as well. Well, all that did was enrich China's government and make them even more powerful and more dangerous. So we made an enormous error um, in, in reasoning there that we have to, you know, we have to change our thinking forever. That didn't work. Yeah. Isn't Hong Kong pretty much a cash cow for them after they finally got control of it? That, that pretty much... Well, I think you know. I think so, and I think that's where the Western powers need to leave. They need to abandon their Hong Kong headquarters. And, you know, and I think that's gradually been going on. You just move to Singapore. You know, that's where you should be, and and abandon Hong Kong. I, I really I think that's the... Uh, because there's nothing you can do. I mean, it's just on the road to being absorbed by China, so what can you do? I mean... What really gets me, too, and let me just reintroduce you here, Brian. We're talking with Brian Maloney. He's a media analyst, co-chair of the brand-new Red Wave America PAC, and editor-in-chief of MediaEqualizer.com. Find, again, MediaEqualizer.com and Uh, RedWave.vote. The real thing that scares me is the fact that we have so many people here in America that agree with what's going on that agree with big brother watching and here we try to say to china let's just let you know uh, the free market economy work a little bit when you've got half three quarters of the world working against a free market economy including the including the left here in the united states it, it really is amazing i think the left wing at this point is just opposed to anything that trump says or does so if he says the sky is blue to them it's pouring rain and so he, if he flips his position then they'll flip the other way that is just mindlessly anti-Trump 24-7, no matter what he says or does or thinks. And, I mean, I think he's enjoying it. I think he, he is able to uh, manipulate that to his advantage, to his credit. I think, you know, he can have fun with it. He seems to know how to taunt them in a way 
that drives them absolutely nuts. And they never seem to learn or grow or adapt or change. It's, it's incredible. So I think we're seeing the implosion of the left right now. I really do. I think that they overplayed their hand this last month so badly, and they strengthened and emboldened Trump to the point now where they actually, they were, Democrats were going to win in November. They were going to take the House and probably the Senate. And now they're not only going to lose the Senate, they're probably going to lose ground. Uh, you know, rather than retake it, they're going to probably lose a couple of seats. The House, I don't know, but we have a shot at keeping the House now. I think we have a chance. I agree. Um, I agree. We'll see. I think it's a coin toss, but I am pretty sure we're keeping the Senate and probably picking up a seat. So well, I, that I got, is. I got to tell you, Brian, and I didn't mean to cut you off here, but. No, no, no. The, the left has become so unhinged and so radical that while they still are a threat to America, I don't recognize them. They're, they've become right. unrecognizable because they are so unhinged and whacked out. The only th- They have no credibility, so we don't need to focus at all on investing any of our time or thought in the left's credibility or their you know, giving them any type of a platform that they don't steal like they've been doing. But what, what, what Americans need to understand is that they most certainly, because they're so well-funded and they're so well-united, they are most definitely a threat. The problem is it's a threat with nothing behind it and zero credibility. Now, <clears throat> one thing that I'd like to bring to the attention of our beloved listeners is some of the great work that you have done that uh, Donna and I, and I'm sure our listeners, because they've heard it many, many times, uh, are grateful for. Brian is the gentleman that helped put together, ladies and gentlemen, the press conference that aired not long ago with our dear friend Kathleen Willey, our dear friend Juanita Broderick, our dear friend Leslie Milwee, and forgive me if there were any others there that I'm drawing a blank on, Brian, uh, Melanie Morgan, I think, was there with you. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Um, and th- there was there were other wonderful people that are supporting a true Me Too cause. And the thing is, Brian was behind that. He was the guy that was on stage that everybody was going, "What's the dude doing up there?" <laughs> and, and and Brian, thank you for that. I mean, I know that personally, we. <sighs> took that footage, edited it, helped EQ some of the questions that were coming from the crowd so that they could be heard better on the, uh, the audio feed. Also, your, uh, your trip over to, uh, who's the numbnut congressman from... Uh, or Al Senator Franken, from yeah. Al Franken. So we went, yeah. What a oh, yeah, that sh- was yeah. a big one, Al Franken. What a complete schmuck. Anyhow, uh, the footage from that little visit that you guys made, along with Sean Hannity's... Uh, segment that he did with regard to this we packaged it together ladies and gentlemen you've heard it countless times on the network along with uh just cowboy logic radio but brian thank you thank you so much because i know that cost a lot of money i know it was difficult i know you probably had zero support for it and uh thank you thank you for for allowing well, those women's you. voices to be heard let's well, uh, i do appreciate that Let's uh, go forward now, though, Brian, as far as Florida, Georgia and Texas with the midterm elections. I think that the Kavanaugh debacle that's happened the last couple of weeks has really energized the Republican base. But you've got people like George Soros and what's that environmentalist tree hugging dingbat wacko guy uh, from the left just putting millions and millions of dollars into these Florida, Georgia and Texas midterms because they're trying to flip these states tom's tom uh steyer that's my that's who i was thinking yeah yeah <laughs> well i was trying to think of which wacko you were talking about because we have <laughs> there are a few of them so they're billionaires unfortunately well i mean so what's what's your take on that i mean because they are putting so much money into this what are you seeing at media equalizer well we have so that's why we created our, our red wave america super PAC, and we have billboards running in texas um of ton of money is pouring into Texas on behalf of Beto O'Rourke, and the left is pretending that he's Hispanic. You know, they never say that he's Hispanic, but they never say that he isn't. And Beto is a nickname that he has used when it's politically convenient, mostly just in the recent few years, um, that he claims was a childhood nickname. His name is Robert, 
Um, the left has decided that he is the next Kennedy, and they have lionized him. Uh, it's the weirdest thing. I don't know why on the left they always have to worship people. It's, 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 they can never just support them and they have to worship them. It's because them. politics is their religion. Yeah. And, and he's running yeah. against Ted Cruz, who is Hispanic. Hello? I mean, the name Well, that's Lord. what's hysterical. But if, if you look at the news coverage, it'll say, you know, Vito O'Rourke has a good chance in a solidly Hispanic state. And I'm thinking, yes, the current senator is Hispanic. <laughs> but they will never say that. They act like it, this would flip it to a Hispanic senator when it, the opposite is true. So one of our billboards is in Spanish, and it says, uh, Be all work is not Hispanic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why won't the media tell the truth? And, that's what, and it's running in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and then on Monday it starts in San Antonio. So we've been doing that because we, we want to get the truth out. We think the news media is lying about Vito very, very badly. So if you go to our website, redwave.vote, um, we, people have been contributing to our efforts so we can get more billboards up. It's very hard on our side to get money because the left seems to have all of it and we don't, but we try anyway. It's and in how Florida, they're leftists, but they're billionaires. Yeah. In Florida, God forbid yeah. Tallahassee's going under with this guy, Gillum, but Oh, he's great. <laughs> well, Gillum is, is a radical extremist and it, it, he is the Democrat. He is currently in the latest poll one point ahead of uh, Ron DeSantis, who is the Republican. Uh, so we have a uh, pretty pretty amazing race going on there that could go either way. So what we're hoping to do is raise enough money to put up billboards in Florida starting immediately uh, as soon as we can. And we want to get very heavily involved there if, we, if at all possible. That way, the race is so winnable. But if we were to lose that race, Andrew Gillum wants to abolish ICE. Um, he wants to raise taxes in Florida in line with California. He's actually said... He want, I mean, people moved to Florida to get away from California taxes. Uh, so he wants to bring, you know, Florida taxes in line with California, which is incredible. Stacey Abrams, too, here in Georgia. I mean, she's well, standing there with Linda yes. Sarsour. Hello. And it's a racial well, aspect, unfortunately, most, though. And in both cases, the blacks may turn out, and that's a, that's a problem. That could be. The, the Abrams uh, candidacy is the most disturbing, I think, of any in the entire nation because she, her own personal life is so reckless. I mean, she has a massive amount of personal debt. I mean, her own finances. I cannot imagine someone like that as governor. It would be completely reckless uh, to elect her. So we just have to hope and pray that conservatives are angry enough to get out to the polls and, and put a stop to all this because if any of these people win, we're in deep trouble in this country. Yeah, we certainly are. All right, tell us a little bit about your organization overall. we got about a minute left. Sure. So Red Wave America is the main thing that we're pushing now, redwave.vote. If you go to Facebook um, and you type in at Red Wave America, it will take you to our page. And we've got a lot of exciting stuff going on there. Uh, we've already got close to 5,000 followers in just our first month on Facebook, and we're growing exponentially there. We're reaching uh, hundreds of thousands of people with our posts. We also have uh, MediaEqualizer.com, our website. And the biggest thing we have is a Facebook group called Stop the Scalpings. We have 111,000 members there. Stop the Scalpings if you want to check that out. That is a great place, a great resource. And what does that do, Stop the Scalpings? Well, that's where we are fighting back against political correctness and, and all the kind of things that you've been seeing going on this month with the Kavanaugh fight. Uh, from the left. Those are the things we are battling there every day, but we have over 111,000 people there, and it's been going on for a couple of years there, and we are doing amazing things there. Where do you get the name Stop the Scalpings from? Uh, well, I mean, what was the left trying to do to Kavanaugh? Scalp him. You know, the left's own terminology we used against them, they have a history of scalping their political opponents. So that's why we call it that. You know, it has an odd name. But it that makes sense. See, to me, scalping, <laughs> since I grew up in rock and roll radio, that's what happens when you want to get cheap tickets. So that's scalping. <laughs> there you go. You scalp I think the it's tickets. very right. appropriate. <laughs> Brian <Yeah>. Maloney, <laughs> MediaEqualizer.com, red, uh, RedWave.Vote, and on Facebook, at Red Wave America. Find them all there. Brian Maloney, keep up the great work. Thank you so much for joining us here on Cowboy Logic Radio. And coming up next, Thank we'll you. be talking to John Guandolo, understandingthethreat.com about Islam. Not radical Islam, but Islam. It's coming up next on Cowboy Logic Radio. Check us out 
out on the web at cowboylogic.us. Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Nguyen. Uh, <laughs> we got John Guandolo on now. Back to you, Donna. I was going to say, I don't think you're going to be restrained when I introduce our next guest, because we know him quite well. We've appeared with him and, uh, and as we emceed the South Carolina Tea Party Coalition Convention, of which he was a speaker. John. Yes, you got in trouble with John. And it's uh, that's just a, a, a guy thing, I guess. But uh, we were pleased to actually meet you, John, last January, and uh, you and Don did get in trouble. We John were, is in. Uh, we were synchronized swimming. Yes, I know. In this. the pool. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> in in January, he goes swimming. <laughs> uh, anyway, I was 89 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy who took a commission as an officer in the U.S. Marine Corps in 96. He joined the FBI. After starting his FBI career in narcotics, he began an assignment to the Counterterrorism Division of the FBI's Washington field office, developing an expertise in the Muslim Brotherhood, Islamic doctrine, the global Islamic movement, and terrorist organizations including Hamas, Al-Qaeda, and others. In 2006, he was designated a subject matter expert by FBI headquarters, where he created and implemented the FBI's first counterterrorism training program focused on the Muslim Brotherhood and Islamic doctrine. He is the co-author of Sharia, the Threat to America, the first comprehensive book on the enemy threat doctrine and the author of Raising a Jihadi Generation, Understanding the Muslim Brotherhood Movement in America. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is again, one John Guandola. Welcome back, John. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Did I, um, did I miss anything else? Any more trouble. I mean, is there anything <laughs> else you've done? I mean, what else? it's unbelievable. Well, oh, oh, your website, the understanding the, the threat dot com. swimming that John yeah, and I did stop. in January. <laughs> understanding the threat dot com is where you can find all this stuff on John. Sorry, I didn't miss yeah, that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that website uh, numerous times, ladies and gentlemen, throughout this you know this segment that we're doing with John. But John, I, I want to start off with a question that. Uh, you know, that we didn't talk about on the break before we brought you on the air here. You know, the, the past three to four weeks have been a, a charade, a mockery of our constitutional republic uh, with regard to the uh, Kavanaugh nomination. You being a former FBI agent, you having done numerous FBI investigations, if you had been able to sit down... And I'm hitting you. I'm hitting you cold with this, so forgive me. If you were able to sit down with both Kavanaugh and Ford, separate, obviously, what are what are some key questions that you feel you would have asked from an investigation perspective of those two individuals? Take aside that you had not yet spoken to any of the alleged witnesses, but if you were able to speak with both of them individually, what are some of the things you would want to ask them? Well, the way. Uh there are a number of ways to approach uh, talking to a witness or a victim or a suspect in any uh, investigation such as this. And this is a criminal investigation. It would be because uh, there's a crime that's being alleged. Um, the technique I used to like to use is you let the person tell the entire story from beginning to end. Uh, and you note the things that stick out as being way out of place. And then you go back and you dig around in those places. That's the way I begin. So I would say, tell me, you know, from the time you uh, began planning to go to this party to the time that you were home, I want you to tell me, walk me through, who invited you, what, get, tell me the whole thing. And right in there, now knowing what we know, if uh, uh, Ms. Ford, Dr. Ford were to, to do that, there are gaping holes, and now we know she even admits I uh, don't know names, don't know places, don't know where the party was, don't, you know, don't have the name of the people. I just remember he was the guy. That right there in a, in a narrative telling the story stands out as being highly suspect. Um, so that's the first part. And, and I would do the same thing um, with him is to say, uh, tell me uh, about this party. And, of course, it would have ended there because he's like, there, I don't know the party that's being discussed. I don't know the house. I don't know the date. I don't know. You know, I'm being accused of something with no location, no date, no time. 
mean, this, this is the problem. Uh, the story falls apart on its face, right? I agree. At the very beginning. So mm-hmm. that's, that's John, from an investigative standpoint, that's the, that's the approach I would use. I got you. Donna and I know a number of people, as do you, no doubt. You probably know many more than we do, that have either been victims or they claim they have been victims of rape or molestation or sexual abuse or harassment. We know, you know, you know the circle that we run in. We, we know some of these people. And some of these people that we know that are describing these events are actually just friends outside of, say, radio, just people we know in our community. These people are describing events much like Dr. Ford's that maybe took place 20, 30, 35 years ago. And they remember everything about it, everything about it. And they describe it back to us in in very great detail, uh, full of colorization. Where Dr. Ford, I agree, it was just very sketchy. I actually thought that Rachel uh, Mitchell, the prosecutor that interrogated or questioned her, did so very well. I thought she did it very surgically. And basically what she did is she opened up all of these holes in this story and and let light in those holes. Right. And I, I think what you know, you're describing is uh, very common among uh, victims of these kinds of crimes. There is a... Uh, the, there is something that happens uh, initially when they, they, you know, people shut down. Uh, and, and I have uh, spoken to people who have been victims of these kinds of crimes. Uh, they shut down, and then you've got, uh, you know, you've got to speak with them and, and lay it out. But when they lay it out, they remember sounds, they remember smells, they remember the touches. They just, it, it's all so, it's like they were in hyper- sensitivity mode. I was just going to say, your senses um, get heightened so much when you're under that kind of um, stress and, and yeah, anxiety. So even, that's right. Wow. So even though they're mentally kind of shutting down because they realize there's no getting away from this, their their entire system, uh, their entire person is, is, is recording what's happening. And they do remember those things. And uh, it is a hallmark of a false accusation when some of these things... Um, are not remembered like where you were the house who owned the house like the fact you coached people on how to pass lie detector tests (laughs) (laughs) and the fact that you're not really licensed in california which uh, again Uh, she perjured himself herself hey real quick though john uh, also before we get to all the understanding the threat and your great work in trying to wake up the american people to the threat of radical islam or islam really in the united states you know, people like Sean Hannity keep saying the FBI, the CIA, the, the rank and file, they're all really, really hard workers and blah, 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 blah. How deep is the deep state? I mean, I know the fish rots from the head down and we've lost a lot of people at the FBI from the top and rightly so. But how deep do you really think it goes at this point? Uh, well, if we're talking about in, in general, in what we're calling the deep state, I think it, it goes down into the agent ranks for sure. Um, I mean, Andy McCabe was a classmate of mine at the uh, New Agent Training in Quantico. And, um, you know, there are um, individuals in the Bureau, uh, the way that, that they're being hired, the way Director Mueller changed some of the hiring practice, who we were hiring, that this is a whole other line of discussion. But I just want to make one point. Uh, under Director Mueller, he began hiring people for their skills, not for the people themselves. In other words, uh, great organizations, in my opinion, are great because you hire great people and then you train them to do things that you need them to do. So the military sends uh, their people, for instance, to Monterey to learn how to speak Chinese. What Director Mueller started doing is getting people who had specific technical skills or speaking certain languages and then made them FBI agents. But they didn't have a lot of the qualities as a human being that you would want them to have, what that does is it uh, creates a cadre of people inside um, that are not the kind of people you want necessarily to be FBI agents. They're more political. Uh, It seems like they're more political. I I think this guy, Christopher Ray, is an absolute disappointment as well, but maybe that's just me. John, let me... Oh, no. Yeah. He's not doing... the, The point is, you're not... 
it, so it's that it's how they're hiring. It's how they're promoting. And it's also, they're not training in the FBI. They're not, creating agents that are, um, you know, they're not vetting people for being patriots that are going to lay down their life for the constitution, for the sake of the founding principles. They're not going to, you know, the idea of protecting and defending uh, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that's the cornerstone of what an organization like the FBI is all about. But when you have people on the inside that are Marxists, that are uh, uh, obviously jihadis um, and people just, in general, uh, in a broader sense, that do not rapidly defend the United States because they don't understand the founding principles, I think that's very problematic. So you have a, while there are a lot of hardworking good people at, at the agent level, there, there's, a, there's a sickness inside the FBI uh, because they do not understand this. And I, I would say that was even going on a little bit when I was in. Um, yeah, this didn't happen overnight. This absolutely didn't happen overnight. John, let me reintroduce you. Your former FBI agent, your real expertise is with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, Islamic Doctrine. John Guandolo also is the founder of UnderstandingTheThreat.com, which is an organization dedicated to providing strategic and operational threat-focused consultation, education, and training for federal, state, and local leadership and agencies and designing strategies at all levels of the community in order to defeat the jihadi threat. And you're the co-author of Sharia, the Threat to America, and Raising a Jihadi Generation, uh, Understanding the Muslim Brotherhood Movement in America. Understandingthethreat.com, though, is the biggie. Go there and you can find all you want about John Guandolo. Yes, Don has a question. John, this past weekend, I saw an article <clears throat> that discussed, uh, it was some claim made by ISIS, that... They are now going to be, you know, beware, ladies and gentlemen, beware, infidels. We are now coming after you at concerts, and it will be with knives. So be ready when you go to a concert, ladies and gentlemen, because ISIS has made the threat that they're going to walk up, and while you're standing there cheering on your artist of choice, you might get stabbed in the back. John, have you heard anything about that now? Well, we've heard a lot of these um, threats like this and similar to this. And uh, the one, one thing I just uh, want to alert folks to, I think that, again, I go back to the key problem are not the individual attacks or even the coordinated attacks that we've seen. The problem is that we have a uh, cadre, an FBI, a DHS, that are literally clueless about this threat and how to address it. And um, that in and of itself is, is the problem. And, you know, just at the end of this week, the president uh, released his new counterterrorism strategy. And uh, while it, it faces uh, a good direction, the actions detailed in it are premised on having an FBI and a DHS that know what the hell they're doing. And they do not. They do not understand what Sharia is, how it drives the enemy. They do not understand that Islam at its core is the problem. 100% of the people that we are facing from the Al Qaeda and the Islamic state on the battlefield or in Europe and the United States. And, uh, all the individual jihadis that we've killed or captured or have killed themselves in the United States and Europe have all said we're Muslims waging jihad to establish an Islamic state under Sharia. That's the starting point for understanding that this is real. This is a war. And so when you get a report like ISIS is uh, you know, the Islamic state is saying, we're going to show up at concerts and stab you. That's just one in a bucket of a thousand things yep. they are doing and will do. Yeah, and I so agree. the problem is we have to root this out at its at the foundation, not uh, looking just for the people that are going to do violence, because the violence is the small part of what they're doing. The heavy hitters are the ones wearing suits yep. on Capitol Hill and advising the Department of Defense, the CIA, and Homeland Security, which is why 17 years after 9-11... We still don't have a coherent counterterrorism. The stuff. enemies within. Yeah, the Muslim Brotherhood. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, you all can learn more about this, as well as uh, a strong suggestion to the FBI and the DHS, which would be, as well as the White House, pick up John Guandolo's book. I mean, John, quite honestly, and I, and I don't necessarily want to plug another guest book during your segment, but if people would go buy your books, as long with, uh, say, Dr. Jim Mitchell's book. Yeah. Enhanced interrogation. And read both of them? 
you're going to get into this. You're going to get into the mind of Islam as well as look and and find out what you need to be looking for in order to help protect yourself. But John, I want to get to what you wrote about talking about concerts. Uh, adding on to that idea, the motive of the Las Vegas shooter. We're hearing crickets. It's been a year. So to me, that is a red flag. It was right off the bat when all of a sudden they had no motives. To me, that says Islam. But you're going a step further and saying it, it might be Islam and Antifa in your latest article uh, dated October 1st? Right. What, what, I'm, uh, what we have put out, and we actually put it out shortly after the attack, uh, because we called it uh, a jihadi attack. Uh, we said at 6 a.m. Uh, after, uh, after the attack, that it was highly probable that it was a jihadi attack based on what we knew right then. And by noon, we put out that uh, it was our, our assessment. It was a jihadi attack. You have the Islamic. So let me just uh, a couple quick things. You have the Islamic state that says on uh, several occasions two where they put it out publicly, including releasing a video with footage of Las Vegas, that we're going to hit Las Vegas. It was a, it was reported on the news. When we brief it, I actually use a clip from, uh, Fox News, where they do a whole segment on, you know, targeting ISIS, targeting Las Vegas. Uh, they're talking about open air events like concerts, and then on October first, two thousand and seventeen, an open air event, a concert, is attacked, and we have, uh, you know, fifty eight people killed and o- over eight hundred and fifty people wounded. This is a huge number, and we have uh, incompetence at the Las Vegas uh, Sheriff's Office, incompetence at the FBI. To the point that the quote that I used in that article and previous articles from somebody in the FBI that I knew that uh, was helping uh, colleagues of mine pass the information we had into the bureau, it was really rejected. And the response is that they don't want to hear that it has something to do with Islam or the Islamic State. They don't want to hear that. It's the knee-jerk reaction that this does not have anything to do with that. And in the end, they ignored evidence evidence that uh, this individual, Brian Hodge from Australia, who lives in L.A., was not only was claimed publicly in news uh, interviews that he was on the 32nd floor at the Mandalay Bay, he claimed in social media that he was staying in, in the room next to Paddock, which actually was the one rented by Paddock. He had two rooms. Um, these are huge things. Now, if he's lying, that's one thing. But then there's a whole series of events to include over the next uh, two days that he's in two places uh, with people from areas of the world, one in Mexico, high ISIS activity. Then he travels to New, Me- New, Me- uh, New Mexico, high ISIS, uh, goes to a place with a guy who owns it. It's from a place in Turkey with high uh, ISIS activity. And the guy who owns the place that he's in is on the watch list. These are huge red flags. And then his travel pattern after the, uh, uh, you know, following all this raises big red flags. It looks like, he was a, a participant in the uh, in the operation and uh, probably the coordinator for the whole organ- uh, operation. And because he's hard left and uh, does have ties into that community in, in Australia, and Australian Antifa was the only other group to offer up a uh, claim for the attack, uh, although there's some discussion that that might have been a, a, a false claim. That's, that's still, it's out there. Uh, it just raises the question if this was the first ISIS Antifa joint operation in the United States. And now we know uh, from FBI reporting that uh, Al Qaeda and Antifa were meeting in Germany uh, to discuss training in explosives, weapons, and tactics. So this is, um, this is on a whole new level. I think the FBI is uh, incompetent in dealing with the, uh, the Islamic threat, the jihadi threat. And uh, I don't see, you know, you've got Christopher Wray testifying before Congress that everything's awesome. The FBI's awesome. We got our, our hands on it. It's just a complete disconnect from reality. So I think there are a lot of issues with regards to the Las Vegas attack that we could, you know, bore down on. But that's that's the general uh, big picture on that. John, how much of the uh, incompetence with regard to the FBI that you're you're talking about here should be and is attributed to you know basically eight years of the FBI purging anything that has to do with Islam and, and the strategic um, approach that the FBI ought to be taking toward Islam, how much of that sh- is attributed to the purging of that from all of their manuals and yeah. their daily life? And the CIA, too, with Mueller. I mean, with uh, Brennan. 
Yeah, I think it's all, that's a big part of it. Uh, and I've talked to colleagues of mine that are still in the Bureau that are, uh, you know, re- retired CIA uh, folks, both uh, people that operated on the ground and people that are analysts um, inside both the FBI and the, and the CIA. And it's, but yes, I, I would attribute most of it to the fact that if you came in the Bureau in 2000 and let's say 2009 or 10, then it's not only, this is an important point, it's not only that you don't understand that Islam itself is a, is a threat that it is a, it's a barbaric system, it's a totalitarian system governed by Sharia, which is foreign law, that mandates uh, killing um, in certain, you know, it mandates that non-Muslims be converted, submitted to Islam, or killed. That's the law, and that's, there's no other part of that that applies. So um, if you understand what Sharia says, what the law of jihad says, that's what it is. In the FBI and CIA and DHS and the national security staffs, and because the local and state police are trained by the FBI, by extension, those folks as well. It's not that they don't know what I just said. It's that they're being taught the exact opposite, that Islam must be a part of the solution, that you must include Muslims when you do these things. You must bring them in to your decision-making, your policy-making, your, your strategies, and that the real threat is from white, racist, right-wing organizations. Right. And that veterans, for instance, are from this is so it's not just that they're ignorant. And I have run into FBI agents when I've given briefs who've walked up and go, well, you're really minimizing the, uh, you know, the, the skin ahead threat. And I'm, I'm just like, have you read your own crime statistics? Yeah, yeah, what exactly. have the skinheads I, I, done lately? Come well, on. Well, the, the thing yeah, is, I mean, if you if you enter the FBI, uh, say, post-2009, what you're being told is that, you know, Muslims have invented the iPhone and the Android. They've developed rocket fuel. <laughs> they, uh, they, they also found the planet Uranus and, <laughs> and that Mohammed was an equal opportunity employer. Why can't the Muslim Brotherhood be outlawed in this country? Well, they can. Uh, you know, and that opens a whole other door. They can. Uh, we know, uh, you know, there was a February 2017 article in an Egyptian uh, newspaper, the Independent Egypt uh, in English. Uh, and when translated, what we find out, the, the sources of the uh, article are literally the the general secretary for the Muslim Brotherhood and the foreign minister for the International Muslim Brotherhood, literally speaking openly, that uh, they coordinated with Mrs. Clinton's people um, to uh, pay uh, a firm in the D.C. area to lobby members of Congress to show them that Muslim Brotherhood is not a terrorist organization and to get uh, articles written by major U.S. media to say that. Now, that's an incredible, those are incredible claims if they're, tr- I mean, if, if they're true, but I just want to point out two facts that go to support. First of all, these are the senior leaders of the International Muslim Brotherhood saying it. Now, it could be, you have to be open, it could be an information operation that they're lying to create dissent in the U.S. government. That is always a possibility. However, when you realize that the director for the Clinton Foundation in Egypt is Gahad El Haddad, who is the spokesman for the International Muslim Brotherhood and was the spokesman for uh, Morsi, who became the president of Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood's candidate, Uh, it lends a lot of credibility to this line of uh, operation. And then we see the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Atlantic all right in that time frame, February 2017 and March 2017, and one of the articles at the end of January 2017, literally all supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. Saying they Why am I not designated. surprised? Exactly. But here's the key. The one article uh, was written by Gahad el-Haddad himself. So the, the New York Times allowed the spokesman for the International Muslim Brotherhood to write an article entitled, I'm, I'm not a terrorist, I'm a Muslim brother. Yeah, journalism I mean, is, is dead. Germ- journalism is dead. John, we only have a couple minutes, in fact, about a minute left. I want you to talk about the Kavanaugh hearings highlighting the dangerous Marxist jihadist counter state operations, an article you just wrote. It's scary. Well, I think what I would love to leave with your listeners is this. When you see hashtag fake news, it's not fake news. It's we know that these media outlets are intentionally lying. And you have to ask, 
lie. And what does it do when they lie? It propels this Marxist movement whose stated objective, if you go to Communist Party USA, Freedom Road Socialist Organization, Coping, go to their websites, they are all about overthrowing the United States government. So when you see the Kavanaugh hearing, you see people protesting from Code Pink, you see paid Marxists, this is not simply people exercising their free, their immutable right to free speech. These are people taking actions in furtherance of a conspiracy to overthrow the United States government, which is against the law. And it has to be looked at that. I believe you could start charging some of these people in the media because we can specifically show they are intentionally producing propaganda in furtherance of a hostile action by foreign powers and by domestic powers that are seeking to overthrow our government. And that is the lens through which your listeners should be looking at all of these things that are going on right now. Exactly. If you go to understandingthethreat.com, you'll see actual pictures of people being paid off. That's John's website. Again, folks, understandingthethreat.com. John Guandolo, it goes so fast all the time. We thank you so much, though, for joining us here at Cowboy Logic Radio. And I leave you with the wit and wisdom of Will Rogers. There are three kinds of men. The one that learns by reading, the few who learn by observation, and the rest of them have to touch the electric fence for themselves. I would say that last one has to be the mainstream media. Have a great week, everyone. Find us at CowboyLogic.us, and God bless America. Cowboy Logic.